Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're covering chapter 16 of biology and this chapter is titled The Molecular Basis of Inheritance. Now the two objectives that we're going to cover here in this chapter are one, DNA is the genetic material, and two, a chromosome consists of a DNA molecule packed together with proteins. Now while there are only two objectives here, there's a lot to cover in each of these objectives. So let's go ahead and get started. The main goal is to be able to understand how DNA replication transmits genetic information. Now, in general, DNA replications allow genetic uh, information to be inherited from a parent cell to daughter cells and from generation to generation. And we're going to see how unduplicated chromosome, right? One DNA molecule and proteins, all right? How we can go from here, where each gene is a unit of hereditary information that consists of a specific DNA sequence, how then we can get DNA replication, and how then DNA replication and condensation is completed to create two DNA molecules which are distributed to daughter cells. All right, so we're going to understand how DNA houses genetic information all right and then how dna transmits genetic information all right and how duplicated and condensed chromosomes right how they are trans uh, distributed to daughter cells so we're going to understand this workflow as we go from objective to objective here all right so first i'm going to set the stage for this discussion all right, by first defining DNA and giving a general overview that will then be followed with a more detailed conversation. And to kind of start this general overview, we're going to say that DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is the hereditary material in humans and almost all organisms. Nearly every cell in a person's body has the same DNA. And most DNA is located in the cell nucleus, all right? Some of that, some of DNA, a very small amount of DNA, can also be found in the mitochondria. So the DNA found in the nucleus tends to be called nuclear DNA, and some of that small amount of DNA that can be found in the mitochondria is called mitochondrial DNA, all right? Mitochondria, if you don't remember, are structures within cells that convert energy from food into a form that the cell can actually use. They're the powerhouse of the cell, if you will, all right? Now, the information in DNA is stored as a code made out of four chemical bases. bases. All right, we have um, our purine ba bases. These are adenine and guanine. Notice these are kind of like these two ring structures attached to each other and made out of pyrimidine bases. This is uracil, thymine, and cytosine. Now in DNA, you'll find adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. In RNA, which we'll talk about later, but just to note here, you'll find adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil instead of thymine. All right, so that's a difference. But there's these four bases, all right, four, uh, there's these four bases that you'll find in DNA that make up the sequence of DNA. And it is these four ones that I draw arrows to. Okay, now, human DNA consists of about 3 billion bases. And more than 90% of those bases are the same in all people, all right? The order or the sequence of these bases is going to determine the information available for building and maintaining an organism, all right? So think of it, think of it like this, right? When you have a computer, all right, and you write a script of code, all right, you write a script of code, blah, 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 all right, that script of code, um, signals for you signals the computer to do something for example to organize all your files in the appropriate place all right think of your dna as the same thing right it uses these four bases just like we use the alphabet the english alphabet to write code dna uses these four bases to write out a sequence a code that tells your body how to maintain itself by creating the appropriate proteins all right encodes for um genes that determine um your, your structure build, your muscle density, this and that, all right? So your DNA is like the code to building you, all right? The human DNA, all right, this order or sequence of these bases, it determines if for information available 
for building and maintaining you, the organism. All right, very similar to the way in which all the letters of the alphabet appear in a certain order to form words and sentences, the same way that you write lines of codes to to have that code um, um, do a process for you, like organize your files or um, fix a document, etc. Now, DNA bases, they pair up with each other. All right, they pair up with each other to form this double helix structure. And we're going to get into it even in more detail here. This is kind of more of an overview of this whole chapter. But these DNA bases, they pair up with each other. A pairs up with T and G pairs up with C. So you notice that one purine pairs up with a pyrimidine. All right, one purine pairs up with another pyrimidine. Purines don't pair up together and pyrimidines don't pair up together. For one purine, you need another pyrimidine and they have specific bases that they pair up with a with t c with g all right c with g a with t all right don't forget that these are called base pairs each base is also attached to a sugar molecule with a phosphate molecule and together a base sugar and phosphate are called a nucleotide and nucleotides are arranged in two long strands that form this uh, form a spiral called our double helix all right and so you have your your phosphate backbone, your sugar molecule, and then your nucleotide, your your uh, um, base. And this whole unit is called a nucleotide. And then you have nucleotides that line up in one direction and on the other direction. And they form hydrogen bonds between the different uh, bases to form this double helix structure. We're going to see images and we're going to re-explain this in a second. All right, but keep this information in the back of your head. All right, let this saturate before we get into more details. Now, the structure of the double helix is somewhat like a ladder with base pairs forming ladder rungs and the sugar and phosphate molecules forming the vertical side paces of the ladder. And then, there, of course, there's a twist to form that double helix. So it's not just a straight ladder. It's a, it's a ladder with twists. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this provides a breakdown of everything we're going to have a conversation about regarding DNA. The only other thing that I want to talk about before we take all those building blocks and, and elaborate on them further about DNA is, well, how did we figure out that DNA is the genetic material and not proteins, right? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just getting over... Um, a little bit of a of, of a bug. But the answer to that question, right, how do we figure out that our DNA is the genetic material and not, say, proteins, which are a lot bigger and a lot more complicated, right? The answer lies in an experiment done by Hershey and Chase. They were actually thinking the same thing. They're like, is the protein the structure that carries genetic material? Or is it the DNA? Right? They were leaning towards protein because proteins are, are more complicated structures. We've covered proteins before in, in, in this course. All right, And there's more amino acids that make up the building blocks of proteins than there are bases that make up DNA. There are 20 amino acids. And so you would presume, well, that, that will result in a lot more variation in sequences, a lot more complexity in the way that those proteins fold into higher order um, complexes. It must be the proteins that can carry such important information that results in our genetics, that results in both our genotype and phenotype, right? It couldn't possibly be DNA, which only has four bases. And, you know, little did they know that it was indeed DNA, and this was the experiment that showed it. This Hershey Chase experiment is a really a landmark study that provided the the crucial evidence established establishing DNA as um as the molecule for inheritance for for um hereditary, right? Now. Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase, they were two bacteriologists working in the 1950s, okay, a time when scientists really didn't know which structure carried genetic information, DNA or proteins, right? Proteins, given their diverse structure and function, they seemed like the prime candidates. DNA with its repetitive structure seemed just far too simple to be responsible for the intricate processes of, of inheritance, right? So, what Hershey and Chase decided to do, they decided 
that they're going to use bacteriophages. These are viruses that infect bacteria in their experiments. All right. These bacteriophages are very simple entities made out of a protein coat, a capsid. All right. And it surrounds genetic material, which can either be DNA or it could be RNA. All right. Now, when the bacteriophages infected bacteria, they can insert that genetic material they had enveloped in their capsid, and they can insert that genetic material, and that will um, affect the bacteria, um, and the bacteria will reproduce that virus since the virus gave it some sort of genetic component, right? Now, the critical element of this experiment was distinguishing between the proteins and DNA of those bacteriophages. And they did this by labeling, labeling the molecules with, with radioactive isotopes. All right. Sulfur 35 for proteins. All right. But not in DNA. And phosphorus 32 for DNA. All right. So they added these little labels on the proteins. All right. Here's a protein. I'm going to draw it really ugly. Here's a protein. To the protein, they added a little tag, all right? A little tag, all right? And it was sulfur 35. That's the tag they added to proteins. And then to DNA, to the genetic material, all right, they added another tag, all right? But this tag was different. To this tag, they added phosphorus 32, all right? And this tag will help them keep track during the experiment, all right? So that they can determine... All right, they can determine the genetic material, which was it, protein or DNA. So they allowed these labeled phages to infect bacteria, and they observed where the radioactivity ended up. If the proteins were the genetic material, then sulfur-35 would be found inside the bacteria. But if it was DNA, then they'd find phosphorus-32 inside the bacteria. All right, simple as that. They prepared these tagged proteins and DNA that they put into bacteriophages that they allowed the bacteria to get infected by. And whatever they found inside that bacteria, that that bacteria took up, all right, would give them a hint as to what was the genetic material. So what Hershey and Chase observed was that the bacteria contained the phosphorus 32 label, signifying that DNA, not proteins, served as the fundamental molecule of heredity, all right? This discovery really paved the way for further research into the structure and function of DNA, which has culminated in our modern understanding of genetics. Very important. We wouldn't have been able to make as many advancements to understanding ourselves, our genomes, um, the way that our genomes play a role in, in carrying certain illnesses and diseases through generations without this important piece of information, all right, that was discovered by Hershey and Chase through their bacteriophage experiments. Now, with that out of the way, all right, with the fact that um, Hershey and Chase figured out that DNA is the genetic material, all right, Watson and Crick later on, and and Rosalind Franklin, all deduced from, from experiments that DNA is a double helix and they built a structural model, all right? And they noticed that it was two anti-parallel sugar phosphate ch chains that wind around the outside of the molecule of DNA, all right? So, of course, with that introduction, we can now discuss all the intricate details that will allow us to understand DNA further. And what we want to start off with here is posing this question, all right, from the beginning. What are the structure and chemistry of nitrogenous bases? All right, we've said that the most commonly occurring are adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, and uracil. All right, three of those are have a structure that, that resembles a pyrimidine ring, that is cytosine, uracil, and thymine. All right, those are pyrimidines. And then the other two have the structures that follow a purine, purine ring, that's guanine and adenine. Now for DNA, you'll see in the sequence for DNA, you'll find cytosine, thymine, guanine, and adenine. All right, in RNA, we replace thymine with uracil. All right, now, the properties 
of permadines and purines, they can technically be traced to their electron-rich uh, nature. These are benzene ring structures here, all right? And they have double bonds here, but these electrons that are found in these double bonds are delocalized. So you can you can see them sort of move around the ring structure. And the aromaticity of these rings um, and the electron nature, uh, the electron rich nature of, of the carbonyl and the and the ring nit nitrogen substituents pretty much endow them with the capacity to undergo um, keto enol tautomeric shifts. Okay, so what that means is that permadines and purines can exist as tautomeric pairs. Now, this is maybe a little too complicated, and you don't necessarily need to know the details of this for biology, but it's important to know that these electron-rich structures allow for the movements of electrons because they're delocalized, and that plays a role in the nature and, and, and properties of these rings. Now, it's important, though, to understand mostly, okay, what are the nitrogenous bases that fall under the, the category of permadine rings and what nitrogenous bases fall under purine rings, all right? You need to be able to distinguish these two. And sometimes in your classes, you'll also be asked to memorize these structures as you'll be tested on them. So in that case, you would also need to memorize how to draw these structures out. Now, with this introduction of our commonly occurring nitrogenous bases, we can then ask the follow-up question. What are nucleosides and what are nucleotides? All right, nucleosides are compounds formed when a base, one of our nitrogenous bases, links up with a sugar, all right? This is nucleosides are compounds formed when a base is linked to a sugar. The sugars of nucleosides are pentose, so these are five-membered carbon sugars, all right? So whenever you see a nitrogenous base attached to some ring structure, to some uh, sugar structure, I'm sorry, all right, this unit as a whole is called a nucleoside. All right, so when you have a cytosine and it pairs up with a five-membered carbon sugar, all right, right, a, a, a pentose sugar, then that forms a nucleoside, and the name of that nucleoside is cytidin. All right, when your cell uh, uh, pairs up with a sugar to form a nucleoside, you call that uridin. Adenine, its nucleoside is called adenosine, guanine, guanosine, and thymine, thymidin. All right. So nucleosides are just your nitrogenous bases paired up or linked to a sugar, all right? Now, what about nucleotides? A nucleotide results when, phos when phosphoric acid is esterified to a sugar OH group of a nucleoside, all right? So then a nucleoside, all right, with an additional phosphate group attached to the sugar, now this whole unit as a whole is called a nucleotide, all right? So nitrogenous bases, nitrogenous bases are going to be, all right, this is your takeaway from all this information. You have five nitrogenous bases, bases you should know, adenine, guamine, thymine, cytosine, and uracil, all right? And these are the four that you'll find in DNA. Now, that's the first level. The second level is nucleoside, all right? Nucleoside are going to be your nitrogenous bases. I'm going to shorten it NB plus a sugar molecule. All right, that's your second level. Your third level are nucleotides. Nucleotides are your nitrogenous base plus sugar plus phosphate group. All right, and that phosphate group is going to be attached to the sugar. So when you see this, this is a nitrogenous base here. All right, that's adenosine, adenine. All right, this is attached to a sugar molecule which is also attached to a phosphate group. This unit as a whole is called a nucleotide. All right? That whole thing is called a nucleotide. All right? Fantastic. So, now that we have defined all those important terms, what are nitrogenous bases, what's a nucleoside, and what's a nucleotide, we can ask now, well, what are nucleic acids? And that helps us dive into the next big question. 
all right what are nucleic nucleic acids and what is dna all right nucleic acids are polynucleotides all right they're linear polymers of nucleotides that are linked three prime to five prime by phosphodiester bridges so if we take if we take a nucleotide and, and another nucleotide all right and we want to pair these together right we want to attach them together all right how are we going to link one nucleotide to another they're going to link through a bond called a phosphodiester bond all right and we can see it right here all right look at how this nucleotide is paired up to this nucleotide notice where they're linked up all right they're linked up from one bond in the sugar from one nucleotide to the other nucleotides phosphate group and it repeats all right one bond in the sugar links up to the phosphate group of another nucleotide and so on and so forth to form a chain of nucleotides and we call this a polynucleotide many nucleotides it literally translates into all right so nucle uh, nucleic acids are polynucleotides linear polymers of nucleotides that are linked three prime this is your three prime position in your sugar to your five prime phosphate group all right they are formed as a five prime nucleoside monophosphates are successively added to that three prime oh group of the preceding nucleotide all right and so what you notice them linked up right one three prime to the next five prime phosphate group one three prime sugar position to the five prime phosphate group on and on and on all right what you notice okay is that this process gives this polymer some sort of directional sense right you have them attached at specific positions and we say that they're linked three prime to five prime all right and so there's a sort of directional sense in this uh, nucleic acid now polymers these polymers that we form these polynucleotides this is the start to understanding what dna is all right this is the very start so we have this one chain all right we have this one chain of repeating nucleotides attached to each other all right this one chain alone this is what forms rna but we're not very much concerned with RNA at this moment, right? Where our focus is DNA. DNA requires two chains of polynucleotides. So pretend we copy paste this on the other side here. And these two chains, one is going to be three prime to five prime. The other is going to be five prime to three prime. So they're anti-parallel. And there's going to be some interaction between the nitrogenous bases of one strand to the nitrogenous bases of the other sta uh, strand. And this is what's going to help us understand truly the structure of DNA. All right. Now, with that, all right, with that, let's quickly, all right, let's quickly look at how this happens. All right. Like we said, one strand of repeating polynucleotides, all right, that's RNA, especially if you see nitrogenous bases a c g and u that's rna but we're focused with dna dna is not a single strand dna is a double stranded double uh, helix all right double stranded helix all right and it's going to have the nitrogenous bases like we said a g t c okay now this picture right here is very good because we can see this dna structure as it would look like all right so dna is a double helix Look at how one strand is five prime to three prime, and the other prime, uh, other um, strand is three prime to five prime. They're anti-parallel. All right, these are anti-parallel to each other. Fantastic. All right. Now notice how here's your phosphate group. Let's see. Here's your sugar, and there's a phosphate group attached to it. All right. And notice how this five prime. 5 prime to 3 prime. All right, notice how your sugar is attached to the other phosphate group of another nucleotide, and it repeats sugar attached to other phosphate group, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And here we have our nitrogenous bases, C-A-A-T. All right, notice on the other strand, again, you have phosphate group attached to sugar, repeat, 
sugar attached to phosphate, phosphate attached to sugar, and so on and so forth. And on the other side, you also have your nitrogenous bases on the strand. So both strands have these nitrogenous bases facing each other. All right. And what's going to happen between these nitrogenous bases is there's going to be some hydrogen bonding that happens between them that links them together. All right. And we can see more closely over here what this looks like. All right. We said, all right, that A pairs with T. All right. And here's adenine and here's thymine. And notice how, all right, here's your adenine. There's this NH group right here. This hydrogen forms a hydrogen bond with this oxygen in thymine. And this nitrogen forms a hydrogen bond with this hydrogen group from thymine. All right, so A pairs up with T by forming two hydrogen bonds between their nitrogenous bases. All right, we also said that guanine pairs with cytosine. All right, guanine pairs up with cytosine. All right, and notice how this oxygen here in guanine forms a hydrogen bond right here with cytosine. All right, this hydrogen in, 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 in guanine also forms a hydrogen bond with this nitrogen. All right. And this hydrogen guanine also forms a hydrogen bond with this oxygen of cytosine. And so you notice that guanine and cytosine, they form these three hydrogen bonds between them. All right. And this is how these two strands are united together through the hydrogen bonding of their nitrogenous bases. All right. This, the two strands are held together in the double helical structure through interchain hydrogen bonds. This H bond pair uh, pairs these bases of nucleotides in one chain to the complementary bases in the other. All right, this is called base pairing. And actually, this leads us to a fascinating conversation about Erwin Chargoff's analysis of the base composition of different DNAs and how it provided a key clue to the DNA structure. All right, so how did they even figure out that this is how the bases pair up? All right, how did they figure out that A pairs up with T and G pairs up with C? Well, that leads us to that discussion of Chargoff's rules. All right, Chargoff's rules, what he noticed and what he was able to state is that in the DNA of any species and organisms, the amount of guanine, the amount of guanine is equal to the amount of cytosine. And the amount of adenine is equal to the amount of thymine. All right, these these equal each other. Adenine equals thymine, cytosine equals guanine. All right. Additionally, he noticed that there's a one to one stoichiometric ratio of purines to pyrimidines. All right. There's an equal amount of purines as there are pyrimidines. All right. That should exist. In the, that should exist. And this pattern is found in both strands of the DNA. So, based off of this, all right, and, and, and his observations, he came up with two parity rules. The first rule st states that a double-stranded DNA molecule should have a globally equal percentage of base pairs. So A percents, uh, percents of adenine equals percents of thymine, and percents of guanine equal percents of cytosine. And the rigorous validation of this rule constitutes the basis of the Watson-Crick base pairs in the, uh, the DNA double helix model. The second rule holds that both percents adenine equal to percent thymine and percent guanine equal to percent cytosine are valid for each of the two DNA strands. So this describes a global feature of the base composition in a single DNA strand. This rigorous validation of, of this rule constitutes the basis of Watson-Crick base pairs in the DNA model. All right, so let's Let's go back to this model, right? Let's go back to this point. James Watson and Francis Crick, they took advantage of Chargoff's rules, as well as, of course, as Rosalind Franklin's X-ray diffraction image of DNA, to conclude that DNA as a complement is a complementary double helix. These two strands, they're held together by bonding interactions between unique base pairs, all right? Always constituting of a purine in one strand, and a pyrimidine in the other. So through these rules, these, these equalities between um, compositions allowed them to understand that, oh, there's a specific base pairs that happens. A pairs up with T, 
always, which is why you find that the number of adenines equals the number of thymines in a double helix. And same goes with cytosine and guanine. All right, and it's also the reason why the amount of permadines equals the amount of purines because in order to form a double helix, helix if there's a permadine, it has to base pair with a purine and so on and so forth. And since adenine always equals thymine, that's that first base pair. And because cytosine always equals guanine, that's the second purine permadine base pair. All right, so this was very important. Now, the cool thing, all right, the cool thing is that base pairing in DNA molecules not only conforms to Chargoff's rules and results and also Watson and Crick's rules, but it also has profound properties relating to hereditary. All right, the sequence of bases in one strand has a complementary relationship to the sequence of bases in the other strand. That is information contained in the sequence of one strand is conserved in the sequence of the other. And so DNA uses four-digit code to encode biological information, and that really is just simply amazing, all right? DNA holds so much information based off of just these four bases that pair up with each other in specific ways. Fantastic. Now, with that, we can move into our second objective, all right? Now, I'm going to end the video here because that was a lot of information for one video, all right? I'm going to let that register and, and, and sink in with you, all right? In the next video, we're going to start to cover, cover the second objective, which is a chromosome consists of a DNA molecule packed together with proteins. If you have any questions on the first objective we just covered, just leave, the, leave those questions and comments down below. I'd be more than happy to answer anything that you, any questions that you may have. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.